This leaving, sort of following it from this morning's lesson, this leaving the services uh, lessons coming from from John chapter uh, eighteen nineteen. This morning, I think I had the PowerPoint nineteen was we were in eighteen most all this morning, but more or less uh, the lesson text I'll read to you in just a few moments. But 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 sort of what scares you? I mean, what, what are you afraid of? Everyone has. Have, you're born with two basic fears: the fear of loud noises, the fear of falling. We sort of argue sometimes with the fear of abandonment and the innate fear, but. But um, but you're, everyone's afraid of loud noise. But what, what scares you? What, what really set you off? You know, if one of these ran in across the room, okay, uh, how many of you would jump in, the, in your chair and scream? And then how many of the women would as well? So, uh, you know, so it, it, would, it, would, it would set some of you off a little bit and some of the women as well. So, so what scares you? You know, uh, you know the, the, the ghost and, 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 and Hank scare you. I remember when the church used to be over there at the, uh, at the where we used to be. And some people said, I wouldn't walk in that cemetery at night. I wouldn't walk through there at night. And Linda says, well, I live right by. Don't bother me at all. You know, so. But, but some people are afraid of ghosts. You know, um, uh, some people, you know, are afraid of heights. You know, would, would you do what that guy did? And that, that's for, I don't, don't know where that's at. I, someone may, who knows, you know, things, uh, may know where that's at. But, but that's a pretty famous picture. I saw a lot of different things, people standing on that, on that, on that, on that, that scene right there. Just the, that rock ledge. <laughs> Some of you shaking, I'm not going to do that. Yeah. Uh, uh, that, that uh, acrophobia, you know, that, that fear of heights. Uh, uh, yeah. <laughs> scene reaction there, you know, uh, yeah. Uh, Tammy was walking a little dog the other night, and she got all excited. She was barking, lunging her leash, and it was a big black snake in the backyard, so like that. Piper was ready to go after it, so like that. So, you know, some of you that that would unnerve you. You know, uh, I'm I'm not I'm not crazy about snakes, but I'm not afraid of snakes. I don't kill them immediately. You know, and and uh, I always told Tammy there's good things about snakes, and so she said, I know the black snakes there, and it gets mouth, and and you know, I've got to convince to keep other snakes away. So you know, so you have to have a resident snake. So you know, does does that bother you? Some of you can't look at it right now. <laughs> okay, or zombies. I mean, <laughs> some people actually lay awake at night figuring how they're going to survive the zombie apocalypse. You know, people are going to eat your brain. You know, how are you going to survive that? You know, uh, the GID poem cookful will sell you a bug out kit. For any natural disasters, including the zombie apocalypse, so you can go 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 gather up and, and find out everything that, that, that you need. So uh, Evan, he'd probably be embarrassed, but he got into this for a while, like that. And I was I was cleaning up the garage the other day, and I found two machetes. I'm like, really, <laughs> really? Yeah. Uh, so uh, not one was good enough, but you had to have two. So so what what really scares you? You know, for some of us, you know, was, oh no, not not that, you know, and not that, you know, uh, with the doctor. A few years ago, I, my throat was like, you know, raw hamburger meat. It was very sore. I knew I had an infection like that. And the very first thing she says, step on the scales. I said, it's not my weight, it's my throat. <laughs> she says, we always have to do that. And I says, but it has nothing to do. I can be fat inside of a sore throat, you know. Skinny people have sore throats too, but step on the scales, everything. So some of that, some of that's not, not too pleasant. I mean, and one of the things I, I know generally on Sunday evening, I'm hitting most people Monday. You know, what's going to happen? You know, some of you have been on vacation or have been waiting. You know, oh, Monday's like that. So, you know, uh, if each day's a gift, I'd like to, I'd like to know where to return Mondays, you know. So, so some of you feel that way. I just, you know, uh, you know, Monday would be a, a particularly bad hell. Just get every day, you know, I guess in hell every day's Monday. Maybe I don't know. So it's just not a bad, not a good experience. But there's usually something that, that unnerves all of us. Something that scares us. And sometimes we acquire fears. Things we're afraid of. So, the context for tonight's lesson from this morning, uh, truth, Pilate says, what's truth? What is truth? And he's staring truth in the face. Jesus is truth. Jesus said, you shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. But yet, Pilate still cannot quite comprehend it. This is a mock trial. It only has one possible conclusion. Prophecy says that Jesus must die. In fact, Jesus knows the manner in which he's going to die. And that's the cross. So, but there's something that happens in, in, in this story that, that, you know, I'll be real honest. I had never really noticed Pilate too much. You know, but, but tonight's lesson is sort of looking at Pilate the man, how he reacts to what's happening, 
and, and then really the, some truth regarding who Pilate is and, and what's happening in him. Jesus had told him, uh, Jesus had told the disciples in John chapter 10 that he lays down his own life. No one takes it from him. Now, tonight's lesson has to be understood in that context. That Jesus is in control, as we said this morning. That this is not done except for by his permission. That, that God is allowing this to happen. That Jesus is in control. Now, it don't look that way. You be on the outside and you look what's happening to him and what's going to happen to him in the text. It does not look that way at all. But we understand that Jesus is in control. And so Pilate was more afraid. Jesus informed Pilate that his kingdom is not in this world, but indeed the king, he is in king of it. And this is really all that Pilate really needed to know. In fact, if, if I can go to John chapter 19, let me just read the text to you so we, we have it all out there. We'll make reference to, to some of these verses again. But John chapter 19, beginning with verse 1. So then Pilate took Jesus and scourged him. And the soldiers twisted a crown of thorns and put it on his head. And, he put, and they put on him a purple robe. Then they said... Hail, King of the Jews. And they struck him with their hands. Pilate then went out again and said to them, Behold, I bring him out to you, that you may know that I find no fault in him. Then Jesus came out wearing the crown of thorns and the purple robe. And Pilate said to them, Behold the man. Therefore, when the chief priests and officers saw him, they cried out, saying, Crucify him, crucify him. Pilate said to them, You shall take him and crucify him, for I find no fault in him. The Jews answered him, We have a law, and according to our law, he ought to die, because he made himself the Son of God. Therefore, when Pilate heard that saying, he was the more afraid. And when he went again to the praetorium and said to Jesus, Where are you from? But Jesus gave him no answer. Then Pilate said to him, Are you not speaking to me? Do you not know that I have power to crucify you and power to release you? Jesus answered, you could have no power at all against me unless it had been given you from above. Therefore, the one who delivered me to you has a greater sin. From then on, Pilate sought to release him, but the Jews cried out, saying, If you let this man go, you are not Caesar's friend. Whoever makes himself a king speaks against Caesar. When Pilate therefore heard that saying, he brought Jesus out and sat down in the judgment seat in the place that is called the pavement, but in Hebrew, Gabbatha. And now it was the preparation day of the Passover. And about the sixth hour, he said to the Jews, Behold, your king. They cried out, Away with him, away with him, crucify him. Pilate said to them, Shall I crucify your king? The priest answered, We have no king but Caesar. Then delivered him to be crucified. So they took Jesus and led him away. See, this text really gets at the, the, the fact that, that the Jews had no, no room in their heart whatsoever to accept Jesus. They were so raised up and incensed with rage that they had no capacity to see the truth. The, the challenge we have sometimes is, is to, to, to read the, the text and, and, and let it be what it, it says it is. And, and you know, we, we read those first few verses and, and, and Pilate scourged Jesus. Now, scourging was not just hurting someone a little bit. In, in fact, very often men did not survive scourging. 
and, and the way the whips were designed was a way to, to remove flesh and open the body up. And, and very often the, the, they would say you actually could see the internal organs and, and the ribs and, and stuff from the body just being flayed by this beating. And Pilate had Jesus scourge. I think an attempt to try to back himself out of the situation. He thought when they saw that there's this broken, destroyed man, that maybe that would be enough. Maybe that would, that, would, that would appease him so he would not have to crucify him because he did not want to crucify Jesus. He tried time and time and time again to get himself out of this. Now, now, now you think, well, you know, I'm not trying to make Pilate a nice guy. I'm, I'm, I'm not trying to say, well, you know, he, he was just, you know, a, a guy in a, in a bad situation because really he, he wasn't a nice guy. He, he had a very bad reputation. In describing his personality, Philo, the, the, the early writers, describes him, his vindictiveness and furious temper, temper. It was naturally inflexible, a blend of self-will and relentlessness. That's a, 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 a early rendering of him in, in a stone monument stuff. Looks something like that, I guess. But he's a, he's just a bad guy. You know, he came up probably born in Seville, the best we can figure out. He, he, he's part of the, the, the Roman Germanicus, uh, uh, part of the Roman army. He fought in the Rhine. I mean, he sort of differentiated himself in battle, made his way back to Rome. And, and he, he was a warrior. He wasn't, he wasn't some, somebody necessarily that, that came up with a silver spoon in mouth. He, he sort of came, and part of his villainous ways was what got him to the point he was in. And then he married Claudia. And she was the granddaughter of Augustus Caesar, you know. Her mother's name was Julia, and she was apparently some character. Okay? In fact, I'd like to read this to you in, in describing just this family he married into. I mean, uh, they were not the nicest of people. <clears throat> he, married, he married Claudia Pork. Porcula, the youngest daughter of Julia, who is a daughter of the Emperor Augustus. James Boyce comments concerning Pilate's marriage. From the perspective of Pilate's future, this was a wise move. Claudia had connections with the highest levels of the Roman government. But morally, it was a disgrace. For Julia, who thereby became Pilate's mother-in-law, was a woman of such depraved and coarse habits that even the decadent Rome, she was notorious. She was a bad person. Augustus, her father, her father Augustus, avoided her presence and eventually banished her. It was reported that afterward, whenever someone mentioned the name of his daughter to him, Augustus would explain, were, would I were childless or wifeless and died? Unlike Pilate, a man of nobler instincts would not have married into such a family. So th don't let me let you think that Pilate was just really this nice guy that got in the bad. He was a ruthless guy. He was a, he was a hardened warrior. He had seen death. He had seen destruction. I mean, he, I mean, and this man is what? Afraid. He's scared. When they said that, that this man professes to be the son of God, there's something in Pilate that recognized. Could it be? Could it be? Claudia, Matthew tells us that, that she warned him, have nothing to do with that righteous man. He's scared. He's afraid. And I think part of his fear is based upon he knew, he knew his own depravity. He, he knew how bad he was in the face of a person who would not even defend himself, who, who, who would not even beg for mercy, who would not even do whatever he could to save his hide. He could not comprehend this. You see, Pilate was experiencing otherworldness when he was present with Jesus. He asked him, he says, do you not understand that, that you're not even going to answer my question? Because I could, I could 
I could free you. I could release you. What does Jesus more or less say? <laughs> you, you, you don't have any power here. You're not as bad as the people who want my death. But, but the only reason you have me in your presence is because God's allowing this to happen. You, you, don't, you don't get it, Pilate. I'm the free one here. You're the one in captivity. I'm the one that, 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 that can truly walk away from this if I chose to. So in an attempt to pacify the Jews, Pilate had Jesus scourged. I never had read this before, but, but it, it makes a little bit of sense to me that they did put a purple robe after the scourging Jesus and that just every wound was bleeding and oozing and, and then they, they put this garment on him only to rip it off again. So it, just think about what that felt like to have that experience. Just, just incomprehensible for me to, to imagine that kind of pain. But the purple garment and always sort of struggle. You know, we're, you know, who volunteered that? Because purple was the, the, the color of royalty. But but the, the, at least the, the one author suggests that I read that, that the purple was not really purple in what we think of it, but the Roman legion wore these crimson, these crimson uh, robes. You know, that was these crimson robes, and, and there's a lot of history why they would wear red and something like that. But the crimson dye would fade, and they would wear these robes, and they would wear them out in the weather and the rain and everything, and, the, and they would fade, and they would fade, and they would fade, and they would fade. And they would fade eventually to a purplish color, sort of a purplish. And maybe you've seen clothing, clothing fade that and something like that. Uh, and so that's probably what it was. It was an old faded soldier's garb. They'd been faded by the sun and they just threw a rag, if you will, just threw it on him to mock him and, as, as king and to do that. So Pilate really, is, is, he's wanting out of this. He, he's wanting to find a way that he does it. So he had him scourged and then, 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 they, then they do this and, 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 and they mock him and they say, oh, Hell, king of the Jews. Then Pilate says, Behold the man. I never really appreciated maybe what he's saying here. You know, I was thinking, you know, here he is, folks. But, but, but implied in this text, apparently, is this pitiful person. Look at him. He wanted the Jews to look at the, his, his body has been rich, no doubt bloodied, you know, just... In total shambles, thinking that once they saw this beaten man, that somehow it would, you know, satisfy their bloodthirst, make them make them say, "Stop! That's enough." Holy, look at him. He he wanted them to lay eyes on him for for trying to, to to bring out some act of compassion in them because he's in a situation he doesn't want to do what they're asking him to do because he finds a man guiltless of anything to convict him of according to Roman law. He'd already told him, he says, yes, I'm king, but not of this world. So he's really not going against Caesar. Caesar's king of the material world. Pilate gets that. But behold, the man. Look at him. He's no threat to, to the Jews. He, he, he's no threat to... Look at him! But the reaction. Crucify. Crucify. Pilate knew that he was wrong. And that Jesus was an innocent man. And when it came right down to it, he had no real crime to convict him of. In fact, you, you remember what, what he put on the placard? His accusation, because it was typical custom that when, man, when a man, when a person was crucified, that their charge was put up there so people would know what crime they committed as a determinant of crime. It was sort of a public execution in a way, you know, and, and if you're a thief, they put thief. Insurrectionist, they put insurrectionist. I mean, they probably already had a draft or Barabbas. I mean, it might have been really long. It was a bad guy. 
And so when, when it came time to put the placard up to say what he was guilty of, he couldn't even write anything that was, that was a law against Rome. He simply put king of Jews. He put it in three languages so everyone would get, this guy's dying on trumped up charges. Remember, he, he does a ceremonial hand washing. I'll wash my hands of this matter. I'm done with it. I, I don't want any guilt of this whatsoever a, attached to me. The historical record on, on Pilate after this is a little sketchy. He does eventually lose power. And historically, it says that Pilate will take his own life. He'll commit suicide. Whether the scenes of this haunted him and, 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 and prevailed him or, 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 or what other great disgrace that, that he thought this life was so unlivable for him. But he lived a tortured life because of his rejection to acknowledge who Jesus really is. So, what makes you more afraid? What do you fear? Scripture says we really should fear God and understand that true righteousness is found only in Christ. That whole piece of the role of the Holy Spirit to, to really bring into reality sin, righteousness, and judgment. I believe what John's trying to get out in John chapter 19 is really Pilate feared Christ's goodness. He feared his goodness. Pilate knew his own character and he was in the presence of someone who was not like him. Who was otherworldly. Jesus in the Sermon on the Mount says in Matthew chapter 10, Jesus, do not fear those who, feel the, who kill the body but cannot kill the soul. We'd rather fear, fear him who's able to both destroy both body and soul in hell. Jesus clearly indicates that we should have a healthy fear of God. The proverb writer says the fear of God is the beginning of wisdom. So we should have the right kind of fear of God. So we should understand that, that our true righteousness is found only in Christ, that we cannot be good enough. We can't practice the moral code to be good. Our true righteousness is found in Christ, in Christ alone. Second Corinthians chapter 7, verse 10. For godly sorrow produces repentance, leading to salvation, not be regretted. But the sorrow of the world produces death. So if you have the... Uh, there's a lot of people who get really unhappy when they're caught in sin. Oh, they're sorrow. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. They're really unhappy about that. But guess what? They just keep going back and doing it and doing it and doing it again. That's, that's worldly sorrow. Now, you can tell with someone's godly sorrow because it requires them to have true repentance, a, a true change of heart. That, that, that's, the kind of, that's the kind of sorrow that, that, that produces the thing. When you look in the face of a righteous Christ and you realize that I am not righteous. Paul wrote in Colossians chapter 3, verse 25, in the, If then you are raised with Christ, seek those which things which are above, where Christ is, sitting at the right hand of God. Set your mind on things above, not on things of the earth. For you died, and your life is hidden with Christ in God. When Christ, who is our life, appears, then you will also appear with Him in glory. I, I, I think I feel some, maybe a piece of the collective guilt in, in my own life in regards to the changing culture. I pray some about it. I feel like you know, you know, God, you know, let your will be done. Or but but but, when was the last time that many of us got down on our knees and really asked God that His Spirit do its work? When was the last time that we really, really spent a considerable amount of time asking God to move mightily 
in this world. Or even in our own lives. Paul said that you need to be thinking on this heavenly realm. Not on this earthly realm. But, but, but you need to set your mind on things which are above, which where Christ is. Not on things of this earth. He said, because, you know, you're, you're dead to this world. To you. It's dead to you. It's rotting. Like we said this morning, it's, it's material world. It, it's going to decay. But you need to focus in on Christ. So, in Pilate's character study we've done tonight, we recognize that he was really a man who was capable of seeing good. As depraved, as rotten, as much as a scoundrel he was, he was capable of seeing good. But the problem with Pilate is he wasn't brave enough and bold enough to act on it. Now we could say that God sovereignly in his life had moved through Pilate's life to put circumstances in people to make him who he was. So at that moment in time, he would do what he had to do. But Jesus, nonetheless, was to control every moment. And he suffered for me and for you. If you're here tonight and you're not a Christian, uh, everything's ready. Within moments... You can be transferred into the new kingdom, the everlasting kingdom, as we studied in Hebrews this morning, the unshakable kingdom. If you're here tonight and you need prayers on your behalf, maybe there's something going on in your life, or maybe just something in your heart and you need prayers, we're going to stand and sing a song with the opportunity to respond once you come to stand and sing.